Hi, I'm Dave Brooks with the Concord Monitor, a longtime moderator of Science Cafe New Hampshire, and welcome to our fifth online virtual Science Cafe since we we can't meet in the real world at the moment. So, so we're all thinking about the big problem of COVID, of course, but there's another big problem out there, which is climate change, a, a bigger problem than COVID, really. And tonight we're going to talk about one aspect of it, uh, what climate change is doing already and what it's going to do to our food supply, to what we can grow and what we can eat and what's going to be available, what isn't going to be available, what changes we might have to make and how we're going to cope with it. We've got uh, four expert panelists who have been looking at various aspects of this problem for a while, can talk to you about it and answer your questions about it. As is always the case with Science Cafe, your questions are, are, are vital to the process, so type them in as you get watching. So um, I'm going to hand it off now to uh, Rick Irving, your moderator, who will introduce you to the panelists and get things going. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Dave. Uh, Dave Brooks, by the way, has been involved with Science Cafe from the beginning. He is also the uh, person in charge of the Concord chapter of the Science Cafe of New Hampshire, and we have him to thank for uh, organizing tonight's session. So, as he said, my name is Rick Irving. I am the moderator for the Science Cafe of New Hampshire's virtual monthly meetings. To our uh, returning members, I say welcome and thank you for coming back. To the new members, we're glad you could join us. We're glad to have you. And um, for your edification, I will go a little bit about the format tonight. It's very straightforward, very simple. So you get a context of, of how all this is gonna work. I will cover a little bit of the history of Science Cafe. Then we will go to the introductions of the panelists. And then we will get right to the heart of the matter. The, the, the heart and soul of Science Cafe is the questions that the audience submits and the interaction we get with the um, uh, between the audience and the panelists. So you can feel free right now, and I'll, I should say this early and often, go ahead and go to uh, your comment section on either Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're watching us, and submit your questions as soon as you would like. So a little bit about the history of Science Cafe. It was started in 2011 by Dan Marchek here in Nashua. Uh, so we will be having the 10th anniversary this coming spring. We have grown uh, to uh, several chapters here in New Hampshire. As I mentioned, Dave Brooks is in charge of the Concord chapter. We also have one in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Manchester, New Hampshire, I believe Lebanon, New Hampshire, and a couple of others. So that's very satisfying to see the uh, Science Cafe actually growing and thriving here. We have done approximately 100 sessions and a wide range of topics. Many of them have been recorded. So you can actually go to our website, sciencecafenh.org, and take a look at them. And if something strikes your fancy, go ahead and take a look at it. Uh, as Dave Brooks mentioned, we this is our fifth session doing the virtual uh, uh, science cafes. So a little bit about the recent past. The very first one we did was in May, and that was for COVID-19, very topical topic. And it was, uh, we had a great panel. I learned a lot, and it was a lot about, you know, what what's the science behind the things like how far apart we need to stay, why you wash your hands, why you wear the masks. Uh, and it was, as I said, very educational. The next one we did was flying cars. That was a great panel. We had three people who represented three different companies developing flying cars. And it was actually very gratifying to see how well, even though they were competitors, they got along and supported each other. Um, one of them was the CEO of a company from California that was able to join us. So that was great. The next month was music therapy, very interesting topic. Then food allergies and sensitivity. Uh, and then last month, we did cryptozoology, which is the Sasquatch, Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, paranormal activity. And I'm surprised to find out that I grew up in 
one of the centers of the paranormal activity here in New England. It was literally 50 feet from my backyard in the Huckamock Swamp. So you can go ahead and take a look at some others, a wide range of things from forensic science to robotics to sleep. Uh, always popular ones are the science of wine, the science of beer. Uh, we did a science of marijuana and the cannabis oil. And to be honest, I learned enough in that that it completely changed my mind on the topic. And opioids and addiction was one that was very topical here in New Hampshire, and it probably is across the country. So we put the first session on in um, in Nashua, and then it was so popular, we followed it up with two more sessions. So the one in New Hampshire, just to show how the audience makes a difference here, and you really affect how the session goes, was very much focused on uh, individual issues and um one of the panelists was a, a pharmacist from in here in southern new hampshire and he told the story about how his son 22 years old i believe had died from an overdose and it was it was pretty heart-wrenching there were some tears in there and then it encouraged other people to share their stories so that was a great session then the next one we did was up in the lakes region um in Laconia, New Hampshire. And that was very different because a lot of the questions were more along the lines of medical issues. So um, again, this is all to drive you to let you know that the questions that you ask are vitally important to how this proceeds and you get to determine which way we go. Um, so COVID has forced us to evolve. We now have to meet virtually. So everybody you see tonight is going to be in a separate place. We are, the panelists are, and I are all in our separate homes. Uh, um, the folks behind the scenes, um, uh, uh, Scott Silva, who is our MVP for Science Cafe of New Hampshire. He's also our tech guru. And he acts as the director for these sessions. Um, he is at his home. Dan Marchek's at his home. The staff of the Science Cafe, which will help us with the questions, are all separated. Um, so that's very different than we used to meet at the uh, Riverwalk Cafe in, in New Hampshire. So there are some benefits to that. One, we have a wider access to the audience. So we will get people from all over the country here uh, watching us and uh, submitting questions. And then we found out later that um, there is dozens or hundreds of people that will tune in and watch the sessions after they are done. Uh, the furthest we've had away, by the way, is a person from New Zealand actually sat in on one of the live panels. And the other benefit is we have remote access to panelists, our experts. So as I mentioned before, the flying cars, we had the CEO from uh, California join us, and we never would have been able to do that. He thought he was going to fly into New Hampshire for a one or two hour meeting. Um, but he, it was it was great that we could have them, and it's great that we can get more access to the experts. and have that interaction with you. So the, the, the basis of the Science Cafe, you know, it was born out of a concept in Europe where people got together and discussed important topics of the day, and, and that's what we're trying to recreate. So to reinforce the, the heart and soul of the Science Cafe is the interaction between the panelists and the audience. The audience definitely has the steering wheel, and you drive the direction of the, sen of the session with your questions. Uh, the expert panelists, with their response, hopefully provide some interaction, some dialogue, and some education. And that really is the basis for success for us in the um, each one of these sessions of the Science Cafes. So, uh, again, uh, please go ahead and submit your questions to us on Facebook or YouTube in the comment sections. The staff of the Science Cafe is waiting to get your questions and triage them and feed them to us so that I can. Uh, announce them and, and ask them to the panel. As a point of interest, we would appreciate it if you feel so inclined to go ahead and include your name, at least your first name, and where you're located so we have an idea about the, the region that the questions are coming from. Uh, we are live, so we will get to as many questions as we can. Normally, we get to all of them, but sometimes we run out of time and we just can't do that, but we will try and accommodate as many as we can. The topic tonight is climate change and food. You know, what will we eat and what will we grow? Uh, Dave, Dave had mentioned at the beginning. So with that uh, being the topic, our panelists tonight, we have an excellent group. Um, 
I will introduce them individually and let them talk to you for a few minutes about their backgrounds and their interests and what their accomplishments are and how they relate to the topic. And then uh, once we've finished with that part, we will go right into the questions and answers. So why don't we start with Becky Seidman, who is the professional, <laughs> professional professor of sustainable, sustainable agriculture at the University of New Hampshire. Becky, tell us about yourself. Thanks. It's a real pleasure to be here. I've never had the opportunity to be part of the Science Cafe before, so this is great. Um, yeah, I, I actually wear a few different hats and I will introduce them uh, kind of briefly, but give you a little perspective about where I'm coming from. Um, I am a professor of sustainable agriculture and food systems at the University of New Hampshire, and I'm quite involved in our undergraduate program in sustainable agriculture and food systems. Um, so we have a lot of uh, students, uh, interact with a lot of students um, who are really interested in this topic today. I'm also a specialist with UNH Cooperative Extension. And in that vein, I work with vegetable and berry producers around the state and the region. Um, and so see kind of firsthand uh, what they're doing, what kind of challenges they're facing and what kinds of um, pretty cool innovations they're doing. Um, and I'm also a researcher with the New Hampshire Agricultural Experiment Station in Durham. And there I focus my work on high value specialty crops, um, in particular vegetable and berry crops. And I'm really interested in ways that we can extend our growing season, um, improve local uh, producers' ability to grow lots of varied things um, that we can then enjoy. Um, and in particular, I'm interested in alternative crops for this region, as well as the things that we normally think of. And I, I'll leave oh. there. Great. Thank you, Becky. So, um, so do your, your students who are watching today, do they get extra credit if they submit a question? You know, I didn't even think of that. So let's say sure. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Next, we have Rob McClung, who is the professor of biology in the biological science department at Dartmouth University here on the west side of New Hampshire. Rob, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, and it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm a, a plant geneticist, and uh, my particular specialty is circadian rhythms. So plants, like people, have biological clocks. So me many of you have the experience of waking up before your uh, alarm clock goes off. And that's because you have a biological clock serving to uh, help you wake up at the appropriate time of day. In the context of plants, um, Plants, of course, unlike people, can't move around. So they have to respond to everything that a changing environment throws at them uh, in place. So they have to do so uh, behaviorally and physiologically. And, and a lot of this is governed by a circadian clock. In addition, of course, we're quite familiar with the idea that many uh, plants flower seasonally. And, and how do they know what season it is and how do they anticipate uh, the changing seasons, that also is uh, strongly regulated by the circadian clock. So my work is, is very basic in this regard, but it has real implications. So one of the things we may be hearing about in the context of climate change tonight is, is the potential for drought. And, and one of the uh, things that the circadian clock does in plants is it strongly influences their ability to, uh, to respond to stresses in the environment. And so uh, that's one of the areas that I've been pushing my research to work in. Uh, so I'm going to be very interested in hearing what everyone else has to say. And I'm looking forward to this. Great. Thank you. And so when we spoke in the pre-production meeting with Rob, my ears perked up as soon as he said circadian rhythm. And I sort of refer to myself as a functioning insomniac. So I'm very interested in that sort of stuff. Next, let's go to Rich. Smith, who is Associate Professor of Cropping Systems and Ecology and Management at the University of New Hampshire. Rich. Thanks, Rick, and uh, hello to everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, like, like Becky, I am a, a 
here at the University of New Hampshire. I work in the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment. And I, I teach and, and do research um, in our sustainable agriculture program. My, uh, my research concerns understanding how agricultural systems function, including how the variability in weather influences the productivity of agricultural systems. And so if we think about you know, a human in enterprise that is influenced by the weather, there's really uh, none I can think of that are more dependent on weather than, than agriculture. So the weather plays an important role in, in my research, either directly or indirectly. Um, I'm also very interested in the pests, particularly the weeds that are problems in our agricultural systems and how these organisms are likely to respond to changes in, in climate. Um, and then lastly, much of my research concerns how agricultural practices such as crop rotation, the use of cover crops, um, tillage or pesticide use may make our uh, agricultural systems either more or less resilient to either weather variability or other factors associated with climate change. So the goal here is really to identify strategies that farmers can use to help them adapt to climate change. Interestingly, some of these strategies uh, could also help mitigate climate change by reducing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. So while farmers will need to adapt to climate change, they can also help help fight it with, you know, depending on the practices they're using. So I'll, I'll Great, go ahead and stop there. Very interesting. Thanks, Rich. And we have Brian Eisenhower, who is the professor of sociology and the director of the Office of Environmental sustainability at Plymouth State College. Um, Ryan. Thanks very much, Rick. And uh, I thank you and Dave and everybody else at the New Hampshire Science Cafe for inviting me to join you this evening. Um, my work, I've been at Plymouth State University since 2003. And um, my work is a combination that's really focused on the human relationship with the environment. And in particular, thinking about how we can communicate more effectively to encourage environmentally responsible behavior. Uh, a lot of my research has been community based and thinking about how community led initiatives can produce more resilient communities and in thinking also about how we understand our relationship with the natural environment. Um, I can say that one of the great parts of my professional experience is working with the students and everyone else from administration to finance and so on at Plymouth State to help us try and take some of these ideals and put them on the ground. And food systems is an integral part of thinking about the human relationship with the environment, to say the least. And I look forward to trying to answer the questions that we received this evening. Great, Brian. Thank you very much. Okay, so now for the audience, the moment you've been waiting for, for everybody, the moment you've been waiting for, basically it's when I do this. And you know, one of my colleagues says that the quality of these sessions goes up direct in direct proportion to the number of words I say goes down. So from here on in, I will just be reading the questions and we'll have the direct interaction between the audience and the panel. So we're off to the questions and we have several in the queue. Our first one is from Jim in New Hampshire. How do our choices of food, what we eat, impact the climate, and what impact can we have this way? Who would like to take that? I do not at all consider myself the ultimate authority, but I'll chime in first in the hopes that others will add their expertise, if you will. Um, food choices and our food systems are critically important in our abilities to deal with climate change. And there are fortunately many, many good studies at multiple levels from the community to the world level that look at the impact of different food systems and some of the changes that we might need to make to meet our goals. Um, one of the sources that I work with and uh, have my students read and discuss is one that really clarifies that some of the dietary choices we make can have as much impact over the next 40 years or even 30 years as um, the total amount of vehicle emissions in the globe 
in the mid 2010s. So we're talking not from about a pretty sizable impact. And in addition, one of the important dimensions is that we know climate change is making our social systems and our food systems less stable. And so preparing to deal with some of those things by creating more resilient food systems is really important. I'll conclude by saying I also think it's really important to consider how we think about as a culture our relationship with the environment. And one of the things that I've had a lot of interest in recently is thinking about both the pros and cons of labels like vegetarian and vegan that often put people in or outside of categories because changing our diets probably isn't um, about elimination of certain foods as much as it is changing some of our proportions and adapting. So I think there is a lot of concern and a lot of reasons to think about how our choices of food really impact things. And we haven't even talked about the distance we travel them and all those kinds of things. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? I'd, I'd be happy to give a couple of thoughts. Um, I think, I think, you know, how, how, how would I address that question? Um, some things to consider would be things like, like the amount of food that we waste, um, I think is, you know, a huge, huge piece of that puzzle. I think, you know, um, another piece of that puzzle, I would say would be um, processed foods, right? And, and so if we can think about ways to reduce our consumption of, of processed foods because those processed foods, um, you know, require greenhouse gases or uh, fossil fuels to produce, you know, at all stages of the of that kind of process chain. Um, in addition, you know, a lot of the ingredients in in highly processed foods, you know, often include things like, you know, corn corn products and and, and soybean products and and the production systems that produce a lot of the corn and the soybean are also responsible for, um, you know, a lot of the, the greenhouse gas emissions. So thinking, thinking through it like that, you know, can we, can we reduce food waste in general and therefore, you know, not, uh, you know, potentially produce less food. Um, and then the type of food, uh, you know, less processed food and, and maybe more locally produced foods where you might be reducing the the food miles and and then the the processing associated with those so those are just some things off the top of my head great thanks rich and um brian a follow-up to something that you had said you know, that the study is being done locally and across the world is there anything unique about this area in terms of those studies and and the findings are they pretty much the same, you know, wherever you go? Well, our history of food systems in New England certainly has some longer time periods compared to some of the other parts of the country that can allow us to learn from. And of course, um, it's, I believe, and I'm going to defer to the experts in sustainable agriculture here, but important to think about bioregionalism and what's really going to grow best in our climate as well. So some of those things we probably need to adapt to as well as these changes occur. Okay. Um, feel free to introduce Bobo Set if you'd like. <laughs> Bobo Set is Brian's dog, who you can, you can hear there with him. Uh, so thank you. Uh, anything else? We'll go on to the next question which is from James in New Hampshire. I have heard that methane is a greater threat as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. One, is this true? Two, does animal agriculture contribute as much to this as the doomsdayers say? Interesting. Well, I'm happy to uh, weigh in a bit on this one. I'm certainly not an expert in this regard. But uh, it is true that methane is a, a greater greenhouse gas, a more potent greenhouse gas than uh, carbon dioxide. I, I think it's about threefold uh, stronger in terms of heat retention and so on. And this has to do with the chemistry of the, the two molecules. So methane is, is a serious problem. 
And uh, I was just reading earlier today an estimate that uh, livestock contribute about, a, I think it's a third of the methane pollution uh, that, that we have now. Um, but there are um, uh, other sources that are a huge, a huge concern. And one, for example, is the permafrost in the Arctic, which uh, has a huge amount of stored and frozen carbon. And as that heats and thaws, that's going to uh, release an enormous amount of methane that is uh, predicted to accelerate the uh, rate of uh, climate change, global warming. Very interesting. Thank you. Anybody else want to take a shot at it? Nope. Okay, then we will move on to the next question. Uh, let us see. We actually have a backlog here. Is there any movement, this is from Phil Brown, any movement on the part of the New Hampshire governor to, as Maine has recently done with their climate action plan, to promote local sustainable food systems and climate-friendly farming, as well as reducing emissions by 45% to 2030 and 80% by 2050. Phil is a retired New Hampshire science teacher and a member of the NOFA, I'm not sure what that means, of New Hampshire Educational Committee. Any ideas on what the Maine is doing and how it relates to what's going on in New Hampshire? Okay. <laughs> well, um, I can only say that I am not aware of that action within the state of New Hampshire. And um, I, again, the sustainable ag folks, I would trust are a little bit, but in terms of watching policy and things like that, I'm certainly not aware of us pushing that as an agenda at that level in the state. Fortunately, with the good works of people like Rick and Becky to push things on the ground up level, pun kind of intended, I guess. Okay. Yeah, I guess I would have to agree with Brian. I'm I am not aware of any um, actions at that level of our government, unfortunately. Okay, great. Thank you. The next question is from David Brooks. Can we change our food crops quickly enough to cope with what seems to be the faster than expected changes in climate? Change them through GMO breeding or other methods. I, I might like to just weigh in quickly on that. And I guess I would say that, um, you know, the world is full of a lot of climates and we have tremendous amounts of weather variability and climates around the world. And we still grow a lot of the common crops. Um, certainly there's regional differences, but, um, while I think that some change is probably going to be necessary as and and possibly something we want to do, um, I think we have a lot of crops that are available to us that are well adapted to lots of different kinds of environments. And so as long as we know what's coming and can have a little time to prepare, which I, I think we're going to have. I would take the optim. I would state optimistically that um, there are actually a lot of crops available to us to grow. We might just be looking at what's adapted in other regions and studying how those might might perform here. Thank you. I see nodding in agreement. Well, I, I do agree with that. If I'm sure I was nodding, I do that. Um, <laughs> And I would just want to add to that, I think it's an interesting question that I certainly don't know the answer to about how quickly we can change our cultural preferences for diet, because that's also part of that picture. Can we get ahead of those changes a little bit um, through our choices to prepare as well, I think is a big part of the picture. I mean, I would say, Dave, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rob. I would say David's raised a, a really important challenge that we face. Um, there's a lot of global changes going on. Um, not only are there increasing numbers of people, but those people in general are having more money. And so they're changing their diet uh, and, and therefore putting greater stress on the food supply. And so the estimates I've read are that by about 2050, it's estimated we need to double uh, global food production um, to raise those who are uh, 
calorically limited by their food supply and, and to improve uh, everyone else's ability to consume as they wish to. And so that is going to put a tremendous challenge on the agricultural system because at the same time that we're going to have to produce more, we're facing a loss of arable land because people are building cities on arable land. And uh, there's a lot of environmental degradation that's been going on. And so the challenge is huge. So I think it is going to put a real stress. Uh, there is concern that a lot of the easy changes we've made to improve yields have been used up and it's going to be harder and harder to continue to increase yields as we've been doing. And indeed, the data suggests that the rate of increase of yields of uh, crops like maize, uh, corn and so on, uh, are, the rate of increase is going down. So this is going to place, uh, place a tremendous challenge. And uh, I think it, it will be a challenge in terms of breeding for uh, uh, improved productivity uh, under all the, in, in the face of these challenges. Great, thank you, Rob. Maybe I'll I'll chime in. Um, you know, we're actually I would say somewhat lucky here in in the Northeast um, in terms of some of the predicted impacts. Um, where you know we're we're looking at um, you know pretty pretty decent supply of of water. You know, going into the next fifty. 100 years, if you look at the climate change predictions for what's going to happen with precipitation, but, you know, other parts of the country like the, the Midwest and, um, uh, you know, the West, um, you know, the, the outlook for, for water is, is, a lot, um, is a lot more bleak, especially with changes in population coupled with, with changes in, in climate. And so, um, as a place to produce food, uh, you know, I think I think the Northeast and, and New England in uh, in particular, you know, there's going to be a lot going going for us um, that will be on our side in terms of being a food producing region, at least from a water perspective. And so, uh, you know, finding crops that are that are adapted to drought and and whatnot. Um, uh, maybe less of a priority here, even though you know we are we do ha deal with droughts, and that that's one of the predicted changes is more frequent and intense droughts. Um, but compared to other parts of the country, um, where you know they really are going to have to figure out ways to adapt crops to to more droughty conditions, um, I would say we're 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 kind of lucky. I would say. Well, uh, thanks, Rich. That's actually a. a an excellent side note to this particular topic, that, that aspect of, you know, the, the environment in, in New England, we do have access to more different types of weathers that we may be at, at an advantage to growing these things. So thank you very much. Our next question comes from whoop, Scott Lewis from Florida. So thank you, Scott, for dialing in. We certainly appreciate you joining us. The question is, are you seeing your climate change in New Hampshire yet? And how does that impact what you are growing there? Well, I'm a, I'm a gardener. And in the 30 years I've lived in uh, Hanover, New Hampshire, I've seen us uh, increase uh, uh, an entire zone in the USDA uh, growing uh, zone nomenclature. So. It's definitely warmed up here, and there are things that I can grow here and have survived the winter that wouldn't have survived the winter 30 years ago. So we are definitely seeing it. Yeah, I, I, I would say our most obvious change is our, our winter winter temperatures. So if you look at you know how climate change is impacting our region, it's really in our most noticeable in our in our winter winter temperatures in in, in that that they're higher warmer winters. I would add on to that, that um, the other thing we, I think are starting to see already is more extreme rain events in the fall and spring. So um, wetter falls and springs. This is the prediction for what we will be seeing. And I, I think we have been seeing it. We have more um, extreme rainfall events and um, more frequent and long duration droughts during the summer. So in many ways, these are not different than what we normally see. We're getting kind of the same amount of rain 
and uh, over the year that we would normally get, but it's coming in sort of different ways. And that can be a little bit challenging to contend with. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is from Alex Weech of Epsom, New Hampshire. Has there been much research on how the timing of first and last frosts will change in New England? And how will the variability change? I'm willing to jump in and say something on this, but um, <laughs> others can others can chime in and add to it. Um, so we are seeing an increasing length of growing season, which would suggest that our first frosts are pushing later and our last frosts in the spring are pushing earlier. So we have a longer growing season. But your question about the variability and how that changes is a really good one. And I don't know the answer, but the the it is definitely true that there is tremendous variability. And while I will certainly agree that the, the growing season has elongated in the last 25, 30, even more years, for example, this year we had frosts in June through much, much of New Hampshire, and we had earlier fall frosts in mid-September, three in a row, um, which is earlier than they have been in recent years. And so you can't always predict that, you know, it's not a certain event for sure. Great, thanks. Our next question. Oh, I'd, I'd please, certainly Brian. Sorry, I'd certainly agree with that. Um, I just wanted to mention the variability is a, a massive issue. We hosted a gathering of New Hampshire maple producers at the University of Plymouth State University. Uh, must be two or three years ago. And we really heard the stories from a lot of producers of how odd the seasons have become, the timing of seasons and the start and stopping with flow. And I think that's an indicator of that variability really affecting things already. Okay, very interesting, thank you. Next, we have Stacy Simoji uh, from Bedford, New Hampshire. How do you respond to the climate change non-believers? <laughs> I, this, as the director of sustainability, I have to say this is part of my job. And so um, I will try, I will we'll keep it short, but my favorite anecdote about this is once I was having a mole removed to my face and we're chit chatting beforehand and the surgeon says, you know, okay, what do you do? So I tell him what I do. And then he starts to cut into my face. And I assumed that that was because we were getting down to business. And it's at this point that he says, yeah, I don't really believe in climate change. So it was in that moment that I try and think of when I have asked this question, because I'm hard to press to think of more difficult circumstances. But what I try and say to people is that whether or not you want to believe in climate change, and I will assert that it's not a matter of belief, it's a matter of you know or you don't, um, the reality is investing in more resilient and sustainable ways of living in communities is better for a lot of reasons. Decreasing our reliance on foreign energy, ensuring our ability to deal with unexpected things like COVID that might interrupt our food chains and other things. So I often try and make the case that whether or not you want to believe in climate change, there's a lot of reasons to pursue the things that that is promoting to make a better world. Okay, fascinating answer, thanks. Anybody else? Then we will move on to question number eight from Laura, oh, from Alex Weech. Oh no, we've done this one from, from Epsom there. Laura, Laura Swagger, how are bark beetles affecting our forests in New Hampshire? And does this relate to the topic? <laughs> I can think of people who could answer such a question, but they are not me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, to my knowledge, the bark beetle issue is uh, affected by climate change far more in the Western states than it is out here in New England. That's uh, an uninformed opinion, but I did wanted to do my best to not leave a question unanswered. 
I have a colleague, uh, Matt Ayers, who studies bark beetles. Um, and he's a colleague at Dartmouth. He studies bark beetles, but he goes to Florida uh, and Georgia and, and the Southeast to study it there. And I, um, I, it's there and, and then also in the West that it's a much, much bigger problem. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Again, from David Brooks, I saw estimates a decade ago that New Hampshire could provide 10 to 20 Five percent of our own food needs, not nutritionally complete, perhaps, but calorie-wise. What do the panelists think of that estimate? Ten to twenty-five percent. I, I've, I've seen um, estimates that I would say are on the lower end of that. Um, I think if you. So just thinking about New Hampshire by itself, um, you know, if you think about the uh, land area we have and how much of that is covered in forest right now, and so the the amount of actual agricultural land we have is is relatively small. Um, so I think you know, based on that, our our ability to to produce food is is somewhat limited, but we we are we do have. Um, other ways to potentially produce food. And if we think about the entire New England region, then then maybe um, those estimates are, are higher. And certainly other states in New England have higher estimates that I've seen. Um, but it's certainly something that folks are thinking about. How much food can we produce in, in, in the region? Um, and how much should we? And how much do we want to in the future? Um, and some of that might involve you know, some land use change and, and um, figuring out ways to do agroforestry better um, potentially and, and, and other types of strategies. But folks are thinking about that. But I would say that New Hampshire estimate, I think is, uh, I, I would put it on the, on the lower end currently. Okay, thank you. All right. The next question we have, we're actually doing very well. There's a lot of questions coming in. Looks like um, from Courtney Irving Wood, who is my favorite questioner, by the way, and you will see why in a minute. Are there specific crops and foods that are most climate friendly? And this is from Courtney in the San Francisco Bay Area, who parenthetically says, hi, Dad, which is me. So are there foods that are, uh, crops and foods that are most climate friendly? Gosh, if I were gonna try to take a stab at this, I would think about foods that can be grown with, grown, harvested, and gotten to whoever's gonna eat them with the least amount of energy involved. And so things that are adapted to where you live and um, things that you couldn't grow with lot, without a lot of energy. That's kind of a tricky, uh, that's, that's not an answer because I think that has a, I think there's not a clear answer to that because it, a lot of it depends on how exactly it's grown and whether a lot of fossil fuels were used in its production. Um, so that's, I want to hear what others have to say about that. Okay. I'm, I'm ha happy to chime in a little bit. I think, uh, you know, foods that um, don't involve the displacement of other types of ecosystems, like I'm thinking, um, you know, foods that include oil palm. So, you know, uh, where, you know, tracks of rainforest are being converted to palm plantations. So that's, you know, from a climate uh, friendly perspective, that's on the other extreme end, um, you know, uh, places where some soybean production in, in places like the, the Amazon, where some of the rainforest is being cleared to, to produce uh, soybean. So yeah, I, I can think of things that are, are not climate friendly. And, you know, like Becky said, I think it's really about how you, how you produce the, the food and, and, and how you get it to uh, the end user with the least amount of fossil fuel use um, kind of dictates what's climate friendly versus what's not. 
in large part. Yes, Brian. I'd just like to add, I'd be remiss given a lot of the stuff I've worked on if I didn't add that it's also worth thinking about changing some of the ways we practice land use. And one might consider how much time, energy, and all these other inputs we have invested in maintaining lawns in this country and how we might benefit from people replacing some or part of their, gar their lawns with gardens, especially those that might use permaculture or more perennial approaches and lower inputs. Okay, thank you, Rob. I see you shaking, you are nodding your head. You seem to agree. Well, there's a, a, a small but but growing uh, movement in the favor of uh, most of what we plant are, are annuals, and we do so in uh, monoculture. And so you have to plant it every year, and then you harvest it, and then the ground is uh, uh, exposed for part of the year. You can do cover crops and so on. But all those sorts of practices when you couple that with these more extreme rainfalls, you're going to lead to uh, enhanced soil erosion, for example. So we're losing soil at a far greater rate uh, than we're generating new soil. And this is witness in those dead zones in the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, where all the soil from the Midwest is running down the Mississippi and off in there. So there's an idea to uh, uh, grow perennials where uh, you harvest the tops, but you, you basically leave a cover uh, and this this has some potential to reduce the sorts of uh, inputs that are needed and lead to greater sustainability. Now, whether or not that's going to apply in New Hampshire, uh, I don't I, I don't know. But but in, in in the general sense, I think there are a lot of things that can be explored and are being explored. Great, thank you. So, as a consensus, I think this really says, Courtney, it's safe for you to come on back home. Okay, next question is from Philip Brown. Wouldn't it be wonderful if sustainable agricultural techniques were being taught as STEM activities in K through 12 education as a way to increase victory gardens that can help offset potential food shortages in the future? Yes. Becky, go ahead. That's it, yes, <laughs> yes. that would be wonderful. <laughs> That would be terrific. Yeah. Okay. I, I agree. I think it would be great for, you know, on top of that, not just the, the uh, food security piece, but just reconnecting people to food production and, and, and instilling a better understanding of where food comes from and how it's produced. And it doesn't necessarily have to come from the, the grocery store. Okay. I'm sensing a four thumbs up on this question. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you, Phil. Next question from James Coburn. Are non-GMO crops resilient enough for climate change, or will we need a mix of non-GMO and GMO to satisfy our needs? The, the, the sort of work that I do is uh, involves a lot of GMOs, but GMOs in the lab. And uh, and I think one of the things, this is a case where I think we can perhaps try to uh, have our cake and eat it as well, because this sort of GMO approach can be tremendously helpful in learning how plants work and learning how to make plants more resilient. But then there, there are sort of two roots. Then one can generate a crop that is GMO to have the desired trait, and that can be really helpful because it's, it's much faster uh, than conventional breeding. And so that's particularly good if we're being rushed by climate change. But at the, same to at the same time, the sorts of things that we learn through these laboratory GMO type experiments can also uh, target particular uh, uh, approaches, and then we can based on a mechanistic understanding of how the plant's doing what we want it to do, that can guide efforts to use conventional breeding, so non-GMO, to try and identify natural variants out there that have the properties we want, and then build them in uh, based on a mechanistic understanding of how the plant can respond to whatever particular challenge in question. My, my sense is 
that uh, uh, the future will hold a, a mixture of both of these. Okay. Um, so I see from the picture there that came with the question, James Coburn is actually one of the long-term audience members of the Science Cafe. So James, we're glad to see you back. Thank you for the question. And on to the next one from David Brooks again. How important are victory gardens, people growing veggies, greens, even a little corn in their own gardens to help feed themselves? Does that really matter aside from teaching us? Yes. <laughs> um, and I say that because I really do think we would be transitioning from, uh, you know, the stereotypical monoculture lawn that's desired in our culture requires a lot of input, is not natural in its form. And so simply by reducing those inputs to grow a few things that might actually produce a stronger benefit for us, um, I think it's a win and something we should encourage. And I want to mention, I really appreciate people's reference reference to Victory Gardens, it's, you know, makes clear it's something that we've done in the past. It's a matter of our desire to make the change. Okay, thanks, Brian. And I think you... I was gonna... Go oh, ahead, Becky. Sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to add on that, uh, you know, I wouldn't minimize that bit about teaching us. Um, for folks that grew up gardening or seeing their parents garden or their grandparents garden, you have sort of an appreciation of where food comes from as Rich alluded to earlier. Um, many, many, many fewer of us have had that experience now and understanding how food grows and where food comes from is really key to being able to be thoughtful about coming up with solutions to these challenges relating to agriculture and our food system going forward. And we do have to eat. And so I, I think that the teaching piece, the teaching us, the teaching us and those around us um, who may not have had that experience is actually really, really important. Great, thanks Becky. Rob, did you have something to add? Well, yeah, um, I was thinking about uh, eating, but not just in the context of people eating, uh, depending on what you plant, you can do wonders for the populations of bees and hummingbirds and so on in your lawn, not to mention groundhogs and other things that like to eat the things that we like to eat. And so, you know, I think having a, a, a diverse uh, a diverse garden can contribute to the well-being of humans and a lot of other species. Okay, great. Thank you. So our next question is from Jim in New Hampshire. What are the current crops New Hampshire can produce and what might be the future crops either as a result of climate change or improved agricultural engineering? So earlier, Rich said that we were lucky I think he said we were lucky in that we have, um, you know, plenty of water and some interesting weather. We also are incredibly lucky in that our climate is suitable to growing lots and lots of different crops. And so what are the crops that New Hampshire can produce? It's practically everything that you can eat, certainly not tropical crops. There, there are a range of foods that we, we can't grow particularly well, but we can, with a little bit of effort, grow many kinds of crops. And our agriculture and our food production system is uh, correspondingly quite diversified. Most of our farms produce lots of different kinds of mixed fruits and vegetables and dairy products and livestock um, and meats and so forth. So there's, there's quite a lot of variability. So, um, I would say that we can grow nearly everything and we may be able to grow more stuff going in the future. You may be guessing that I'm really optimistic about, um, you know, our ability to adapt, but, you know, longer growing seasons is enabling us to grow some crops that we didn't used to be able to grow very effectively. Um, it may also make it more difficult for us to grow um, some crops that perhaps need regular water throughout the season um, and so forth. So there's definitely some 
uh, I think we've got some challenges ahead of us, but I'll stop there and let others weigh in. Okay, thanks, Becky. Optimism is good. Anybody else? No, I, I agree. We can grow a lot of things here in uh, New Hampshire, including peaches, right? Which is, I mean, that kind of tells you, you think of Georgia peaches, but we can grow some really great peaches here in New Hampshire. And uh, diversity, I would say, is is the key. You know, we can grow a lot of different things and we, and we probably should as a means of um, adapting to climate change. So if we think about uh, food security, um, being able to grow a lot of different things, if you're a farmer, having many different types of crops that you're growing, uh, that helps protect against one or a few of those, um, you know, crops being nailed in, in a particular year because of, of, of variation in, in the weather. And so the more diversity you have, then the more kind of insurance you have against uh, climate variability. Um, on the flip side, uh, we can grow a lot of things and we'll probably be able to grow more things as it, as it gets um, warmer, but we'll also be able to, you know, grow more pests too. So the pests <laughs> are also moving and adapting. And, and so we're seeing pests that typically were more of a problem in the Southern regions. We're starting to see those inch their way up to the, to, you know, our region as well. So uh, the climate might become more suitable for growing more crops, but also we might be encountering more pest issues as a result as well. All right, that's interesting. Very uh, Thanks, Rich. Uh, next question from Anonymous. Actually, I know who Anonymous is. What does climate change mean for wild animals as a food source? Wild animal aficionados? Well, in a general sense, I can ex I can share that I think many of us are aware that we already see wildlife population changing in response to um, some of our climate change influences. The moose population has been going down in New Hampshire, for example. So I would expect that we would see a shift to an increase in some game and a decrease in others. Um, again, I think moose and things like that that are closer to the edge of their range are probably going to decrease. And we might see some turkey and coyote and other things that prefer um, changes in land use and a little warmer climate be more successful. Okay, great. Uh, next question is from Robert from Bedford. How would growing grapes and therefore the wine industry be impacted by change? Or would we, or we, would we just see a change in terroir? This one piques my interest. I do work with grapes in New Hampshire, so I'll weigh in from that perspective. So here in New Hampshire, we have um, we we can grow certain kinds of grapes um, quite well, um, the Native American types and and hybrids between the Native American grapes and uh, the vinifera types that are that grow in warmer climates. We can't grow vinifera, so things like Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon and so forth won't grow here in this state um, well. And we can't guarantee if they grow through one year, they're gonna survive a winter. And so it's actually, it is winter cold temperatures that preclude the survival of those warmer needing, those great cultivars that need warmer climate. So as climate warms, we may be able to grow more, we may have a broader palette of varieties that can be grown here. But at the same time, that variability question is key because even if climate warms, we may still get very uh, shockingly cold periods that will kill a perennial crop that's tender. And so I would say that um, likely we can expect some slightly improved conditions for grape growing, maybe a shift in varieties, but we are probably going to see uh, it's still going to remain a somewhat risky venture in a, a colder state like ours. But who knows? In keeping with my optimism, maybe we'll be the next Long Island. Um, <laughs> that may take a while, though. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Um, it's actually getting close to eight o'clock. I don't know if we have one more question or not. Uh, question from Dan in New Hampshire. Does climate change, fo climate change foster fundamental changes in soil chemistry? Interesting. Um, I don't, I don't know about fundamental changes per se, but, um, certainly, uh, climate change can interact or, or I should say the, the weather variability associated with climate change can, can interact with soils in ways that could, um, exacerbate greenhouse gas emissions. So for example, uh, if you have, uh, um, a, a, a large rain event after a, a drought, um, then that influx of water into the soils can stimulate some of the nitrous oxide emissions from soils. So nitrous oxide is another greenhouse gas uh, that is also stronger um, in terms of its warming pot potential than, than carbon dioxide. And so you can get a flush of nitrous oxide, especially in a, in a soil that maybe has been over fertilized or where there's a lot of fertilizer left in the soil, a lot of nitrogen then. And so, you know, processes like that can happen where, um, or if you have a, a, a flooded soil that stays flooded for a long time and there's a lot of organic matter in that soil, um, then you could have increases in, in methane emissions from those soils. Um, so those types of things can happen as a function of climate change, but in terms of a, Kind of a fundamental change in soil chemistry. I, I, I'm, I can't think of, of an example of that. Maybe some a change in pH over time could occur. Okay. Anybody else? So we are at the end of our questions. Um, thank you for the audience for sending those in. Uh, as always, we want to send a, a great thank you for the audience for tuning in and participating. And on behalf of the audience and the Science Cafe of New Hampshire staff, a huge thank you to our panelists. You have been very generous with both your time and your expertise, and we certainly appreciate it. So thank you very, very much. In closing, uh, if you wish to donate to the Science Cafe of New Hampshire, basically covers some of the production costs. You can see the button on our webpage, or Scott has just put that up on the screen for you there. You can go there and anything that you would care to contribute, we would certainly appreciate. And in traditionally, we haven't done a science cafe in New Hampshire uh, in December because everybody is so busy. Uh, the, the audience, the panelists, the, the, the people that work here at the science cafe. So uh, we won't have a session in December. So the Science Cafe wishes you all a happy and safe holiday season and a very healthy and prosperous 2001. We will see you again in January of 2001. So thank you and good night. And we got some closing arguments from Dave. And so take it away, Scott. All right. Well, thank you very much for watching. We appreciate it. Uh, Science Cafe New Hampshire is going to take December off, but we'll be back in January. And so you can keep watching at sciencecafenh.org, our website for the schedule. You can sign up for the newsletter or the announcements. So we'll send you an email and let you know about it. And of course, you can give us money, a little bit of donation to keep this entirely volunteer uh, effort going. There is a link in theory showing up over there somewhere in uh, cyberspace. And that's what you can use. Uh, thanks very much for watching, for participating. And we hope to see you in two months. <laughs>